Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. You know who I am, I'm Rick Dion's mechanic. Today I'm gonna to be working on my own Yamaha Venture. I just uh, put out some uploads for my friend Peter's Yamaha Venture. Everything's working great there. But I've got a bit of a problem with mine. I went out for a ride with my other friend Peter. He's got a Summit. I know a lot of Peter's there. But uh, my machine, it was minus 21 outside. Uh, and it overheated. I know it's kind of ironic. You're in the snow, super cold, and your engine overheating. So I was able to borrow this kit from work. This is a universal cooling test kit. Uh, we're going to see if I have any outstanding issues. I had an issue in the past regarding uh, some leaks on the cooling system. So let's get to that. All right guys, and this is what the kit includes. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be using one of these universal adapters. I'm going to be pressurizing the cooling system and monitoring with this gauge uh, at about 15 PSI to see if I've got any leaks. If the gauge continuously drops down, uh, then it's a problem. And then it's a matter of finding out where it's leaking from. Hopefully it's not the head gasket. Maybe it's just a loose connection somewhere along the system. But when I stopped on the trail with my sled, which is still over here, it's on the trailer, haven't used it since, uh, it was down about a liter of coolant. Now, luckily, I always carry a bit of everything, so I had some coolant available. We actually went out and got some water nearby as well once the bottle was empty, just in case, because we were quite a ways in. And uh, so we're just going to get started. All right, so you guys want to follow along on this side. We're going to get this test kit set up. So this system here, this is my radiator cap. There's no cooling, uh, sorry, there's no thermostat in this cooling system. So if you look down in here, we're still full, which is a good sign. I've got a camera person today, got my daughter filming for me, so thank you very much. Makes it a lot easier for me. Hopefully more interesting for you guys as well. So one of these caps or one of these fittings should fit nice and tightly into this hole to seal it all up. Universally, and we'll see, well, oh, look at this. Maybe this one. I'm gonna add this cap in here. We're gonna expand this cap to make a perfect seal on the system. Maybe this is actually gonna be a double feature too because later on today, my dad's supposed to show up with his sled. We're gonna go out for a ride and he's got some belt uh, adjustments to do because we're also going to be installing a new belt if he ended up getting one. I didn't get to talk to him since. Okay, so now we got this all nice and tight in there. That should seal it up just well. And now you're going to wonder, well, this gauge goes up to 30 pounds. Uh, what are we going to be testing the system at? Well, that's a pretty simple answer. You're going to look on this. Okay, this cap is really rusty. It doesn't really tell you on here but it's 0.9 of an atmosphere. Now what does that mean? Well, one atmosphere is 14.7 pounds. So 0.9 of that is give or take 14, 13 and a half, 14 pounds. So I'm gonna go up no higher than 15. So I'm gonna attach this right here. I'm gonna make sure that's all nice and tight. Cross your fingers, guys. Uh, this might be a short video. I hope it is. Pressurize it up. We're going to go right at 15 because that's a nice round number to watch. And I'm going to let it sit here for some time and see hopefully that it's not going to go anywhere. All right, so it's been about two minutes now. And as you guys can tell, the gauge hasn't budged one bit, which is a good sign. I was really concerned um, because being a liter low is quite a bit. So I'm gonna look around, you know, obvious stuff like around head gaskets here, uh, possibly even base gaskets down below. And of course, being that it's a snowmobile, we've got all sorts of little hoses, connections right here. It goes, snakes underneath the engine, goes out to the other side because if you guys aren't familiar with snowmobiles, the way they get cooled is if you go underneath here, you've got these heat exchangers so these ones, Yamaha back in the day, ran a heat exchanger all along each side of the foot rails or foot wells. Of course, you have one more back here at the back. 
and there's another one right at the front of the track. So I'm going to check all my connections. I'm not seeing anything loose right now. I'm not seeing any drips of any sort. Because here is one connection right here. There we go. There's a little bit of light there. There's one connection here. And it goes up to the top. Right up there. Everything seems tight. It's looking good. So we're going to wait another few minutes. And while it's in the shop, I might just, you know, grease some of these points. So like I did on Peter's machine, I'm using a white lithium. Because that seems to be the grease of choice when it comes to snowmobiles. Alright, that about does that. Alright, so it's been almost 10 minutes now, and that has not budged. If you guys want to take another close look at this, I'm really happy about that. Now, to give you guys a bit of a background story on this particular sled, uh, when I first got it, the heat exchanger in the front had a hole in it, track had been studded, studded went through the, uh, the heat exchanger, and it had been repaired with like a, I'm going to call it like a JB Weld product of sorts. So we took it out, or I took it out, had it welded professionally, uh, aluminum, because it is an aluminum heat exchanger. And then at the same time I had the motor out, I decided to do a top end on it. And this is what I found. All right, so you guys have probably noticed maybe in the shop, I've had this piston and cylinder set up, sitting up on top of my room up here for a little while. And that comes from my snow machine, because these are gifts to the gods of speed. Let's take this down and take a closer look of what I had found. And this is what opted me to do a top end on this. If you guys see all the scoring marks, this thing had run real hot, probably because it was always low on coolant because it was leaking. Uh, and it also gouged up the inside of that cylinder really good. So I had to replace the cylinder. Let me highlight that up for you. Actually, it was very, very lucky that the pin, because the pin is actually seized as you see it there. Uh, if it would have migrated out a little bit more and caught that port, that would have been catastrophic. So, the sleds right now, uh, it's got about 13,000 kilometers on it. Still got the original base, or the original crankshaft, I should say. Crankcase, didn't open that up. But, uh, what I'm going to say now might shock you. So after I had rebuilt it, it took me a full season, so basically a year's riding, to get that system to operate properly because I kept having the odd overheat here and there. And here's why. So I've worked on snow machines in the past for many years as well. But being that this is a horizontal cooling system, meaning that the fluid runs horizontally and the engine is actually sit pretty low in the system, the heat exchanger at the back is at level with the top of the engine. So what that causes is a really difficult time as to bleeding air out of the system. I didn't know this. Maybe there's some Yamaha guys out there that could have helped me about two years ago. But there's a bleeder underneath this seat. So what you have to do is remove the seat. You don't have to remove the backrest, but you would remove the seat at the front here. There are two bolts or four bolts I believe inside this pocket. Take the seat out. You'll see a bleeder. Fill the cooling system where we're testing it at this point, and at that point, it'll help bleed the air out of the cooling uh, heat exchanger at the back, which will allow the system to flow. Because what was happening for me, I would be going down the trail, I would ride for about five minutes, overheat light would come on for about 30 seconds, it'd come off, and it would continuously cycle throughout the entire ride. So the, the engine was running really, really hot. And for the life of me, I could not figure it out. I'm passing this along as a public service. Check the cooling system on the backside of these Yamahas. Okay, so it's been quite a while now. I forgot what time it was. It's been about 15 minutes-ish. We, we only lost about half a pound. I'm going to say that's good. So why did I lose, or what I thought was lost, a liter of uh, coolant? 
probably because I had an air pocket in the system that finally made its way out after sitting this uh, this summer. So let's take this cooling tester off of the machine. We're going to bleed the air slowly like this. Remove that off there. And once we remove this up, we'll put the cap back on. We'll fire it up. All right, so we got the kit all cleaned up. Back in the case. We're gonna close the hood. And like I promised, we'll fire it up for a little bit. Just because it sounds so cool. I love these triples. But I don't wanna run it too long because it's very smoky. Here we go. So what we have here guys is a 2014 Bearcat XTE and we're just going to be doing a quick, a quick service like I was saying earlier we're going to replace the belt we're going to shim the belt properly I'm going to show you guys how to do that and we're going to go top to bottom we're going to grease the entire undercarriage and the front suspension as well. some kind of a grease fitting. So there's one here, one at the back, and one on this articulating part of the suspension. That's the one really cool part about these Bearcats. You can back up in deep snow and not get stuck, unlike my venture over there, which will just dig itself a hole. So we're just gonna go ahead and hit these with, you guessed it, white lithium, like I was talking about earlier, and just did it on my sled. There's another grease point on this section over here, guys, and one on this shaft and right up, in, up on top here at the hinge point for this bolt. There's another shaft in there and there's a grease point in there as well. We're gonna hit all those three. So just like most sew machines, you're gonna have another grease point on the steering pin arm on this particular model. It's at the back here, it's kind of tucked away. But even more importantly, there's a hidden grease fitting that not everybody knows about. I'm gonna point it out here. On this whole linkage mechanism inside, if you follow your tie rods, you're going to have one pivot point right here. And there's also one further in on the opposite side. In order to get to those, you'll have to turn the skis so that that grease point faces out. And that's uh, pretty important when you're looking at greasing the entire machine. A lot of people forget this one. If it gets dry, you might end up with a sloppy steering. All right, so we're going to move on to shimming and removing that belt. I'm oh, sorry, I made it sense backwards. We're going to remove the belt, reinstall the new one, and shim it. So we're just going to open up the cover like we just did there. Then two bigger clips on the side here. And this whole shield will remove. We'll put that aside. Then what you're going to do is you're going to want to put the heart brake on here. With a 14 mil or 9 sixteenths, you're gonna remove this bolt. Just like this. Pry this cap off like that. 
Now notice that there's some shims behind this O-ring. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But in order to get this belt off, you're going to take this bolt, put it back in with the cap upside down. And at this point, you're going to thread this back in place. So you might have to remove one of these thicker washers in order to do that. Mm -hmm. Just to get the thread started. Just like that. And from that point on, you're going to be able to tighten up that bolt. All the way in until it's snug. And that's going to open up the secondary sheath enough for you to remove the belt just like this. Alright, so this is the old belt we just removed. And we're just for fun of it, I'm going to zero the mic here. And right at the lettering, we've got 35.47 millimeters. And the new one, again, we'll just do it for sake of argument right at the lettering. 40.92 millimeters. So that's quite a bit of a difference when it comes to th belt thickness. And that's where the shims come into play. So let's put the new belt back on and we'll go over the shimming process. All right, so you guys will notice that there's an arrow facing forward and that's the direction of rotation. That's what you want to face forward because the engine is rotating this way. You're going to place the belt this way. If there are no arrows, always make sure that the lettering on the belt is facing out so you can read it. So let's go ahead and slide this in place. Just like that. And then from there, we're going to remove this bolt with the cover. And I kind of got ahead of myself. I should have left the cherry picker on the back because we're gonna have to rotate the track now. But we were talking earlier about these shims. So what you would do in order to shim the belt, you would remove or add some of these shims after removing the O-ring. Now, if you add shims, it opens the sheave. And if you remove shims, oh wait, let me, I might be wrong about that. Let me test that three, but either way, these shims are available either at your dealer, of course, but they should come in your toolkit. So check that out, make sure you have some. All right, so now we've got all that back in place. I've set up my uh, cherry picker once again. Uh, there's two ways we can do this. We're gonna take the brake off, of course. We're gonna fire up the sled real quick. Obviously, guys, I shouldn't have to say it, but safety first. Make sure there's nothing around any of these pulleys. There's a, without a guard or anything, you don't wanna get your hands or fingers caught in there. So let's fire it up real quick. We'll just rotate, give it a shot of gas, give one full revolution of the track, and then that should bring up the secondary and we'll see what the tension's like. We'll reset the part right here and we'll take a look. So, now from where I used to work at the dealership, we used to say the thickness of a dime above on these machines is what you're looking for. So that's pretty close, but I can't seem to remember for the life of me what happens when you add or remove a shim. So we're going to experiment with that. We're going to take this out again, and in the toolkit, I found a thicker shim. So we have two shims in here already. We got a thin one and a thicker one. I'm going to remove the O-ring without damaging it. Remove the thinner shim. I'm going to add the thicker shim in its place. Replace the O-ring here. Put it all back. And we'll see what happens here. Let's fire it up one more time. Remove the part break. So what happened now? So we actually have more distance between here. So it's actually gone up, which means that adding a shim will close up the secondary sheath. Now we know. All right, so after going back and forth with some shims, uh, we found what we like. So we're going to go ahead and put the cover back on. And just to recap, as the belt wears, you add a thicker shim. So next up, we're going to go ahead and change the spark plugs on here. I mean, spark plugs to me are consumable. They don't last forever. 
especially on a two-stroke engine, so real easy on these. We're just going to look at this control here, remove the cover. These two Torx bolts right here, you're just going to screw these out. They're fairly long. There they are. So we'll pull them out just so we know that they're full. Okay, now this whole console is ready to move forward, just like this. So it pivots on the bolt, or sorry, there's a pin that goes across. Then you can go in here and you can reach down, and there's a big pigtail here. Got it. There you go. So we got that out. Now you can take this whole thing, put it aside. Articat for these particular sleds, this is a 570 fan cool, by the way. Uh, they recommend a NGK BR9 EYA. So the EYA stands for spe a Special Electrode. And what it is, if you take a quick look at these, there's a little bit different than your average plug in the sense that it's got a solid tip, which is not a screw on, which is great. And the electrode has a V inside, which also helps distribute some heat. So I guess that's why they run it. They don't carbon up as quickly. They don't foul as quickly as your regular ES plug. You guys have probably seen that if you're, any, uh, if you're a snowmobile avid guy like we are, Back in the day, that's all I ever run was a BR9ES. This is a direct replacement. Screw these out. Not in bad shape, really. Oh, you got some smoke coming out your cylinder. That's hmm. awesome. I would say that would still be good, but for the sake of doing a service, we're going to replace them. We've already gapped these, so they're good to go. And in case you were wondering, the torque on these is half a turn to two-thirds of a turn after snug. Right there. We'll do the next one and then we'll be good to go. It's always good and always handy to have an old belt on you uh, when you're on the trail because you never know when you're going to shred one. Uh, so, some of these machines are actually limited on space. I know there's a whole bunch of space underneath the seat, but that's already full of other stuff that we keep in, in on the trail because when you're on the trail, you, if it's cold, you need to get back. So, nuts and bolts and all sorts of everything in there straps to pull another machine out or yourself out. So what we're going to do is I found a nice little spot down here. I started doing this and I figured let's add this to the video. We're going to mount this belt on a wire right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the muffler. I'm going to go in there with a small drill, make two incisions with some mechanics wire. We're going to keep this belt in place. It's going to be far enough from anything hot. And it'll still be accessible from the panel here, so that you can kind of go in there, undo the tie, and you got yourself a belt. Alright guys, so with the muffler removed, you got a lot more space. So what I've done is I've kind of coiled the belt up in a couple of spots, taped it up, made two holes, one here and one there. And if you go on the inside here, you've got some mechanic wire holding it in place. The belt is nice and tight, it's not going to go anywhere which is a good thing and worst case scenario I added uh, a lot more mechanics wire than we need because again you're on the trail if you ever need a piece you have some and I hope you guys like the video thanks again for watching and we'll see you all in the next video